It's January 18th, 2021. This is Rook. Among the surprising elements found in immigrant stories is that while they have similarities, they're nowhere near uniform. As such, in the Iranian diaspora, we have those who left Iran more recently and feel quite Western, and others who grew up outside of the homeland but are super Irani. The talented singer-composer and Persian Satar virtuoso Fadid Shafi Nuri is a good example. He was born and raised in Corpus Christi, Texas, but he's become a master of Persian classical instruments and a teacher of Radif. A compelling new voice on the global scene, Fadid Shafi Nuri joins us, plus Mona from Melbourne and the best selections of letters from our inbox. I'm Gian Gomeshi. This is Rook. Hi there, welcome to episode number 77 of Rook. Salam dustan aziz, mizuni, mizuni mizun. Do you know where I got that from? No. The mizun bashin, now our, uh, our famous saying. Of, it was actually an uncle of mine. My dear old un- uncle Behrang, who uh, is no longer with us, but he used to, as a kid, when I was a kid, and you know, he'd get on the phone from Iran or oh. they when they moved to Canada, he would say, Mizuni, Mizuni, Mizun, Mizun. <laughs> That's where I got it from. So now I ask you, Mizuni. Yes, I'm Mizuni. All right. Hey, what does it mean? It means like, um, are you? I think it it officially, it literally means like sturdy, right? Are you, are you built properly? Are you uh, kind of? It means are you bala- uh, balanced? Now? Right. Yeah. Here's the thing. I think actually the, my, this might have some sort of link to our uh, upcoming guest because Mizun is isn't that some s- a slang or is a term in music, in traditional music? Mm. Uh, Saws no, or whatever. No, actually, that mizan is measure in music. I mean, it's the same. Oh, it's a different yeah. thing. Yeah. Uh-huh. Do you guys want to take this outside? Or <laughs> 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 Shows off to a good start. <laughs> Internal squabbling about. Uh, well, anyway, mizun bashin. Uh, how uh, how's it going, everyone around the globe <laughs> listening in? Hope, hope that you uh, you guys are sturdy. Uh, you're balanced. Built. How uh, you're you're balong. You're balanced, as uh, I would say, balong. Uh, we are on an ongoing mission to build a new audiovisual encyclopedia of Iranian diaspora identity. Who are we outside of Iran with our Iranian descent? That's what we're, our mission is. Uh, it's a it's a an ongoing mission to try and discover. We're coming to you on SoundCloud, uh, Instagram, YouTube, the Spotify, the iTunes, the Telegram. Um, so in just a little bit, as Reza, Captain Reza, I should say, intimated, I'm going to be joined by the acclaimed singer-songwriter, multi-instrumentalist, Persian setar virtuoso, Fadid Shafi Nuri. What a story he has. He's a very interesting artist. I hope if you've heard of him or seen him perform, you will. I hope you will listen into the whole interview we're about to do. Um, and if you've not heard of him, Definitely listen in because he's a very interesting cat in our Persian diaspora. Talented guy, thoughtful guy, wild story. Uh, tune in. We have Mona from Melbourne calling in from Australia in about an hour from now, the Persian priestess of Proverbs. Captain Reza, as you heard, is here. Mizuni. Mizuna Mizun. Mizon. 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 Uh, Groovy Shaya. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Shaya. <laughs> and the fabulous Keon. Hello, Gian. Hello, fabulous Keon. I'm seeing you virtually today, but uh, you look you're as fabulous as ever. Yes, happy Blue Monday. Oh, yeah, did you that's know? That's right. It's Blue Monday. Mm-hmm. What does it mean again? Uh, it's apparently known as the most depressing Monday of the year. Mm-hmm, it's I, uh, I guess it's after the holidays, and uh, you know, credit card bills usually come what few weeks after. So right, I, it's something like that. That's why. But well, I don't feel so. Are you blue. feeling blue? Not really. Are you mm. feeling blue? Mm, I wasn't, but now that you think about it, it's, <laughs> it's, Tried to it's a, bring up horrible. My li- li- life is horrible. No, that's uh, you're right. Uh, we should overcome Blue Monday with a little fatty chaffy Yeah. Huh? Yeah. 
I said he's, he's, he's Italian. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Mizuni, my apologies <laughs> to anyone Italian who wonders what I just did. That was a Persian person trying to do. I listened to a bunch of After Hill this weekend. I love that record. You know, mm. I mean, it's quarantine, so not a lot of going out anywhere. You got to consume some music. If you missed our last episode, uh, it was last Thursday, which was the day before After Hill dropped his debut album. It just came out. It's called Tehranto. It's it's so good. I'm really enjoying mm. it. Yes. Right, Shia? Even though Keon doesn't like it. Are you kidding me? I oh. love oh, After I thought you said Hill. something like I'm not. Like it. Oh. <laughs> 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 oh, this new label I have. I actually I love After Hill. I you can do. honestly say You don't that, like yeah. hip hop. I love hip hop. Oh, what are what you is saying? it? There's something what you didn't like. With you? <laughs> I can't remember. <laughs> but once no, you said here, you like no. jazz and you Yes, know. I love jazz, but I also I grew up on western hip hop. What I right, said was right. I don't really Oh, under- you don't like Persian hip hop. I don't understand Persian hip hop, so like, I don't, so you really don't like listen Persian to hip-hop. it. I didn't say I don't like <laughs> it. I said I don't listen to <laughs> it. Uh, uh, <laughs> are you going to get the vaccine? You're going to get me in trouble today, aren't you? Uh, uh, well, uh, how, how you know, I was going to ask how everybody's weekend was. I saw uh, Captain Reza up on Instagram. You posted uh, some delicious fixings for your for your breakfast on Sunday. Yeah, I've and uh, was that calipache? That was calipache. It, it looked, I, was, I wasn't sure. Yeah, that was. So you uh, did the calipache. I did the calipache. Now, bro. once again, we should explain, uh, this is a graphic warning to our non-Iranian <laughs> listeners. Be careful. This is like watching one of those uh, videos from Storming the Capitol, us <laughs> describing what Kalepache is. But for the non-Iranian, Kian, would you like to do the honors and explain what uh, Kalepache is? I mean, I'm, I'm not a fan of it. So basically, as it's a It's kind of tra- like Persian hip-hop for you. You don't <laughs> like it? Like, <laughs> it's the most horrifying <laughs> scene. Basically, it's uh, sheep head mm-hmm. and tongue and brain mm-hmm. uh, cooked up in some kind of uh, like a stew. And and stuff, yeah, I mean, I've heard it's stew. delicious. I just, I don't like the view of uh, a cow's head a oh, sheep's head is it sheep, sheep's head sheep, sheep, sheep's head, head in the head, morning yeah. that's not and yeah and that's the other thing it's consumed in the morning that's right like, yeah, mostly it's and you eat practice. the eyeball oh. and, yeah. uh, and the, the tongue the tongue do you um, eat yeah. calipoche i i have had some uh i had me some calipoche <laughs> a couple of times with a pint not so bad i enjoy i watch football oh, you know yeah. if i don't think about it mm. listen quite frankly i i was vegetarian for many many years I don't know if you know that. Did no, you know that? I did not know that. Many, over 20 years. Wow. Yeah. And then I started eating meat again. And even with meat, I if I if I see the animal, I can't eat it. Yeah. Like if I think about that, like so I'll eat like chicken fingers, right? Like, like a, a piece of something that looks nothing like the animal so that I feel okay. So uh, yeah, with this like calipache, if I don't think about it, but if I see an eyeball, I mean, no, I can't. I can't do it. But I, but I can hear the saliva dripping from Reza's <laughs> mouth as he talks about it. I'm the opposite. If I don't yeah. see it, Wait, I can hear. You? No, I'm joking. But you want to, you want to know an interesting fact? Did you make the calabacha, by no, the way? No, 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 no. no. It was ordered. You didn't. In. You didn't s- in. slaughter the sheep in no. the backyard. <laughs> and Jesus. <laughs> By the way, I don't know. You're kind of old school, Shirazi. You know, I wasn't yeah. sure. Yeah. Yeah. No, but you know, it's funny. The fact that this was my first time having calabacha in Canada. Oh. I hadn't had it since I left Iran. And how did it measure up? It was interesting because I, I had kind of forgotten the taste, if you will, and it, it but it brought it brought back like childhood memories and stuff. Because in Iran, we never went out to get it because my mom never trusted like stores. So if anything, my grandmother used to make it at home and every now and again, like mm. we didn't have it every time because it's very oily and heavy. heavy. Yeah, it's such a. What's your favorite part? Uh, uh, the f- the meat f- the f- meat uh, of the face part ah, of it. Face meat. Call the face meat. Face Banal meat. Goose, this yeah. is a, this is what it's you like know. Hannibal people Lecter. hear this and then they go, "You see the Iranians." <laughs> this is I told you they're barbarians. <laughs> I had it with shots of tequila in the morning. Oh, wow. okay. That was that was lady Captain Reza and his. Uh, Significant I other. I love Calipoche. You do. Oh, well, well, I wasn't really time. asking you. Shai. I, is, <laughs> I assumed you would say yeah. that. Yeah. It's an I'm acquired taste. The, the no, the I, it's newer it, elements in the. You know what? W- no, it's the best uh, best way to, for example, at 4 a.m. <laughs> after. What's it the best way? 
it's a 4 a.m. Yes. after you had a lo- long hard party and you had munchies, so yeah. it's the best way to go. To you, if what you have the munchies, you mean? If yeah. you, have if you have the, the munchies, munchies yeah. that's the so best yeah. way. To it's like eating uh, a dozen pizzas, but all in a. Yeah, one but place. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why is it consumed in the morning? That's what I want to know. Because it's heavy, and you and there is no need to eat after when you have. To Doesn't it push. knock you out though? It kind of does. Yeah, like aren't you? Like when I get the four a.m. because then you're knocked out and you wake up at noon. <laughs> but you got up in the morning like yeah. so, you, you had it like for brunch, right? Yeah, no, well, yeah, it was like nine, ten, ten o'clock in the wow. morning. Wow, we had in the morning. Can you imagine these people? No, they're animals. <laughs> <laughs> What's going on with them? But you know, I was having it. I was like, this should be called Kalejush, oh, <laughs> the oh, one that yeah. freaks you on out in the last. But you know, uh, my mom when we were young did used to make tongue. Mm. Yeah, is it uh, good? I, I can't. Uh, well, I guess it was wasn't sandwich? it wasn't sheep tongue though. It was like a cow tongue. Yeah, cow, cow tongue. tongue. And mm. yeah, it was, it's yeah, it's. I mean, it wasn't so bad. I mean, other cultures consume. Cow yeah, tongue. Italians yeah. have cow tongue. No, I mean, and they consume brain too. You mm-hmm. know, like uh, well, when, I, when you think about it, why not? It's if you're going to eat one We're eating the rest part, of it. Exactly. Yeah. You've just talked yourself into some calipache. <laughs> That's right. Next weekend. I'll get there. All right. Well, on this note, let's get to some music. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Captain Reza, Groovy Shia, the fabulous Keon. We'll see you guys. And by the way, we have letters today. Yes, we uh, do. Letters about yeah. uh, what about After Hill. After Hill, uh, Faradad Fahazad. Faradad uh, Fahazad. Yeah. The last f- three episodes, probably. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah. All right. All right. All right. Yeah. And uh, so we'll get to that. And Mona from Melbourne. We'll have a new. Uh, I don't know if it's a proverb. Quite frankly, she comes up with idioms or sayings sometimes. But she will join us from Australia in just a little bit. Let's get to our feature guest. Our feature guest today is a widely celebrated and acclaimed singer, songwriter, composer, multi-instrumentalist, and Persian setar virtuoso. Farid Shafi Nuri was born on the coast of Texas and grew up an American kid, but he has studied under masters in Iran, such as Ostad's Shoari, Lotfi, and Zulqadr. Fadid introduces the classical and folk sounds of Iran to his distinct musical world, populated by driving rock beats at times, Sufi trance-like states, psychedelic loops, Hindustani ragas, country lilts, and more. He weaves it together with the timeless verses of Rumi and Hafez, modern poets such as Sohrab Seperi and Furukh Farakhsad, in addition to his own lyrics sung in Persian and English. Sometimes he mixes the East and West on a popular American song that you might just recognize. Take a listen to this. Message keeps getting clear. Radio's on and I'm moving round the place. I check my look in the mirror. I want to change my clothes, my hair, my face. Man, I ain't getting nowhere. I'm just living in a dump like this. There's something happening somewhere. Baby, I just know that there You can't start a fire You can't start a fire without a spark There's guns for hire Even if we're just dancing in the dark There you go, a little taste of... Farid Shafi Nuri doing the famous Bruce Springsteen song from the 1980s, Dancing in the Dark, but with a distinctly Iranian and Eastern infusion. Farid has been a leader of various ensembles of wide-ranging genres, from the eclectic post-rock ensemble known as Tehranosaurus to the traditional Persian classical trio Seda. He has also collaborated with master Hindustani musicians, as in the Setar Sitar project, with electronic artists such as Govinda and the Sunray project, and with notable classical artists such as Sabah Alizadeh and Susan Dehim and open for indie rock band Beirut, as well as the Houston Grand Opera. Farid's latest concert tour, Microtone, explored the deeper roots within classical Persian music and how this cultural heritage is anchored in the natural world. It was, of course, abruptly halted due to the ongoing pandemic, but even better, he's joining us on Rook. Right now, Farid Shafinuri joins me from Austin, Texas. Hello, sir. Hi, Gian. What a pleasure it is to have you on the program. Yes, it's the pleasure is all mine. Nice to hear your voice and uh, good to be here with you today. Uh, yeah, I've been looking forward to talking to you. You know, I, I need to tell you this right away. You don't look like someone who was born in Corpus Christi, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> I've been told. I've been told. <laughs> you, look, you look like a guy who's living in Cameron Shaw. I mean, I mean, uh, <laughs> 
I, I thought I had it tough with the olive skin and prominent nose in London as a kid. Were, were you always aware that you could never quite be Brad Pitt? I mean that with all due deference, of course. <laughs> well, well, absolutely. I mean, I, I recall during the first Gulf War here, and I mean, living in South Texas, you could only imagine uh, when when you're sent to school with a lunchbox smelling of chambelide, uh, chambelide, which is, you know, the primary ingredient of Gorma Sabzi, Automatically from there, you are demarcated and separated from uh, the society and you're, you're somehow culturally ostracized. So then I guess I just dived into being as Persian I po- as I possibly could. I was like, okay, if I'm not one of you, I guess I, I need to oh, really be I am. <laughs> interesting. I want to get to that. And, and, and wow, being in Texas during the Gulf War as a kid, that, that's, that, that's got to be an interesting story. Let me, let me ask you about the present day for a second, because I just mentioned that you had this tour, Microtone, and these were your, you did a few performances of it that, that were in January of 2020, about a year ago. And then after that, COVID intervened and your tour was canceled. How did the tour cancellation impact you mentally, uh, financially, psychologically, having planned this big tour? Well, it was, uh, yeah, as you can imagine, I know you're a musician as well. When, when you uh, give birth to a new project, uh, it's like your baby and you, and you want to see it grow and, and you want it to be received by uh, your audience. And as you know, we, we took it on tour, I, I believe we performed it about 11 times uh, in various cities. Our last show was in Los Angeles uh, with the Honar Foundation. Um, this is uh, Sashar uh, took a liking to the project and we brought it to uh, West LA. And after that, we were excited to take it off to bigger cities and uh, different places. And we had a tour lined up that just went, you know, like, sort of like a flat line on the, the heart machine in the hospital. And, and that's exactly how it felt. I felt that my uh, child uh, was somehow taken away from right, me. Right. But, but, you know, in, in the process, you know, we uh, having to halt something that you've started, uh, it, it did shake me at my core. And uh, obviously, it, it made everything somewhat unstable on all fronts. But, uh, you know, quick, quickly, at some point, like a, a few months in, I, I realized that, okay, this, this may not be going back to normal anytime soon, right. when I think of something else. <laughs> but you, but And uh, at the same time, I know you've been, in recent years, creating an online school of classical Persian music theory known as the Radif Retreat Institute. So I was guessing this would actually be the best time for online teaching, so that that has probably filled the gap for you. Is it, Would that be true? That that's very true. You know, I I, I never actually imagined myself uh, dedicating, you know, a majority of my time to students at this at this day and age. But it, the I I realized that you know this was an opportunity to give back, and the institute has taken off. I mean, I'm sure people are all somewhat scratching their heads at home, being like, okay, well, I have this Persian sitar sitting there in the corner, and I've never really, and I and I think that I'm really picking up on that demographic, Gian, which is. You know, kids such as yourself and I that are somehow dual I- identities hyphenated at their core. And uh, they're like, OK, this is a time to get in touch with my roots. And the classes are taking on um, a, ho- a whole new identity. It's it's beyond just learning the music and the music theory, which is based off of the Radif. And I'll get into that later. Um, it's turning into a connection with their cultural identity. Yes. They're learning the poetry. They're learning the uh, the music on an emotional level. A, lo- a lot of a lot of these kids don't actually. Uh, they don't spend their days driving around listening to shajariyo, you know. Uh, but but now they are, and and it's sort of like an a, an acquired taste that I think is beginning to cultivate and. It just needed a little bit of a push and cultivation, so I'm I'm happy and honored to be. Uh, Interesting, you, you're intimating that the that the students are more so people like you and I who grew up in the diaspora, reconnecting with our ancestry, rather than somebody who came from Iran five years ago. Right, and and I and I actually think it's because of uh, they're picking up on on my own. Um, you know uh, the identity crisis that I've somehow been able to overcome, or or still, you know, my my music is is the arena where I kind of reconcile my my two polarities. But but I think because primarily I do I do use the English language as a form as as a, as a major tool. It is bilingual. I, we do speak uh, in Persian, especially when we get to the the poetry, because it's not you know the classical Persian music, especially Radif, it's uh, based 
on music theory, which is based on classical Persian poetry. So, yeah. so essentially, what with a lot of these kids, and I call them kids, we're, we're friends, we're very, we're very uh, colloquial together. Uh, they're they're re- they're realizing that in order to really get to the to the crux and to the depth of the music, they have to really understand what the poetry is shaping the music. So. So essentially, we're yeah, we're we're really getting into the the language as well as the notes in between. Let me give people another a taste of your music because we also, I mean, we played the uh, Dancing in the Dark. It's but it's sort of a fun cover. Um, th- this this might be a better example of reconciling your polarities, as you just put it. Uh, uh, this is a song from your first album or your 2011 album, I should say, Behind the Seas, and this is called Bani Adam. What can you tell us about this? Well, Beni Adam um, is is a, a poem by Sadi, 14th century uh, poet who traveled, uh, you know, profusely through uh, the Far East, and he wrote. And I guess with his uh, experiences of traveling, you know, the roads and the Silk Roads, he he came to the realization that all of mankind, all the children of Adam, are of the same essence, and therefore, if one it hurts, then we all hurt, and we have this collective responsibility to have empathy and sympathy and and i believe in the united nations this this poem is uh, etched somewhere on on at least I, i've been told and um i i figured you know this poem that every persian knows you know actually my father very jokingly says you're singing a song that's written on every 18 <laughs> wheeler that's driving down uh the highway i'm like yeah but the fact that nobody put it to music is remarkable to me so i sang it and, and by and the way it's new to it was new to me i mean i don't i only know it through you so uh <laughs> awesome. so it, it's not it's not that obvious to those of us who didn't grow up perhaps in iran or aren't as steeped in the poetry let, let me play a bit of it this is farid shafi nuri bani adam <laughs> From 2011 in the album Behind the Seas, Bani Adam, that's Farid Shafi Nuri, my guest today. A, a, a kid from Texas. That's what you just heard. <laughs> this is, I mean, uh, sorry to, you know, you're, you're used to telling this story or uh, it, it might be old hat to you, but I'm sure there's people who are, who are tuning in who may not know you yet, who think um, this is, this is a very interesting story. You're a, a kid who was born in Texas, growing up in Texas, the heart of the American South. We know it as other than Austin as real Republican territory, you know, how did, how does that kid get interested in traditional Persian music rather than listen to, uh, you know, Bon Jovi or, or GNR? Uh, is, that, is that a rhetorical question? <laughs> no, it's a serious question. Oh, well, okay. Well, uh, truth be told, I'm scratching my own head at times that how come I, I fixated in such a, you know, almost in an autistic way in this music. I, I really thought about it. I was like, you know, I, I didn't really even know the popular music around me growing up. And I, I was in the orchestra, I was in the symphony, the youth symphony here in Corpus Christi. And I remember like in between uh, these pieces, we would be playing Bach and Beethoven and Mozart, Vivaldi. Uh, as the conductor is like taking time with another section, I was a, I was a cellist uh, at that time. I was uh, 11, 12. And I, I would just play and doodle, you know, Persian classical pieces that I would hear from Bad uh, I mean, the music was very prevalent in the house, obviously. my. My father was a was a big uh, uh, aficionado of classical Persian music, and and maybe somehow that rubbed off on me, but but not not so because, you know, I I think what happened was when I when I visited Iran, I think the first time I I went as a kid, I went for a summer in in ninety six, I want to say ninety five or ninety six, and it was then that I went to a cassette. So I actually still own like three hundred. Uh, cassettes and i bought this cassette of um i think the the name of the album was asadaya sohane esh by sharon naziri and mm. i believe uh, ke khosropur naziri was the, the uh, songwriter in that and that album just shook me to my core it, it was it was heavily uh, it was 
very Kurdish, you know, it was a classical Kurdish music with tambour and something really raw and rock and very visceral. It really just, it grabbed me. And I think I, I brought back a lot of albums for me. And then from then on, I, I kind of delved deeper and deeper into it. And, uh, I don't know. Maybe it's a past life thing. <laughs> How did you, you you mentioned Barnamea Golha? That I mean, that that uh, iconic series in Iran ended in 1979, quite uh, spectacularly, of course, with the revolution. Uh, how did you hear that? That's before you were born. Where did you Where did you access that? Well, uh, I prior to 79, uh, before my parents moved to South Texas, of all places, it's still an anomaly for me why they did that. Um, they, <laughs> my father worked uh, for Farhang uh, Farhang and he had a complete uh, discography that he brought with him, uh, with himself to to America. And actually, you know, instead of cartoons, I actually was watching old Persian black and white movies and listening to classical Persian music. Like it was, it was very much a pr a present force in the house, and I think. And I, I took a liking to it because it was, you know, it was the music that I would hear waking up. And my, my father always tells a funny story that, you know, he would put me to sleep with, you know, the likes of Marzia, Golpoy, Gani, Iraj, and uh, musicians that, that he grew up knowing. And I, I ended up knowing, too, as I grew up. It, it really, it really uh, kind of freaks a lot of people out when they realize that I'm from South Texas. I am very American, but I'm also extremely Persian. In some ways, I... I, I identify with that archaic Iran or that post or pre-revolution Iran uh, culturally because that's that's kind of what I was fed. In what up. ways are you very American? Well, in the ways that I'm very American, I think uh, <laughs> I want to say I, I might be a bit, bit of a risk taker, a, a daredevil when it comes to uh, doing some hiking and camping and biking and you know maybe the outdoors the the rugged living that i that i kind of grew up with here in in uh, texas that kind of uh, has taken hold of me and i i guess the cowboy in me is very much alive i'm i i you know the I, texas and being texan as an identity uh goes a, a bit deeper than being like an american and i and i feel um out here uh, it took me a long time to really endorse that part of myself i actually kept rejecting it i kept feeling that you know I, I, I wouldn't even allow myself to You rejected to sing the American English. side. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, you know, so like singing that, co that cover you just heard Bruce Springsteen, it was kind of like a, um, it was like a psych psychological exploration for myself to allow myself to be like, you know, you actually do have a, a Southern draw if I really want to like let it out. I, it's kind of hidden deep inside me, but I, um, the love and the connection I've had with Persian classical music in particular, you know, Xi'an Jun, uh, in, in our culture, we have architecture, we have cuisine, we have poetry, we have carpets, we have so much richness. But one of the richness that I, you know, and that's why my uh, Ready for Treat Institute has taken hold is I feel that uh, the classical Persian music we have and the heritage we have behind it has really uh, not been noticed on a popular level. Mm. And now I'm reaching a place in my career and in my life where you know, the fusion aspect of, of, of myself and trying to figure out where do I stand in this polarity, I'm kind of over that. You know, essentially, I feel like the identity politics around it don't don't really move me as much. So I've, I've gone deeper, actually, into the authentic source. When I went to Iran in my, my mid-20s, I was studying with um, some masters that back then, if I had the maturity that I have now, and if I was in Iran, I think... I think I would take a, a deeper hold of it. Well, I mean, you know, you're you are dealing. With, we're all grappling with polarities. We're all grappling with split identities in the diaspora. Whether you came here three years ago or you you grew up here like I did, or you, even your family, your parents came before you. You know, um, like some families did. But uh, but it's clear. I mean, you've said in an interview earlier this year. I was listening to you. You said I was born in this land, being the United States, but my soul belongs to another land, in which you meant Iran. Uh, that. That speaks for itself. I I still want to go back to. I don't want to harp on it or as yet. I mean, I want to ask you about this this kid who with the lunchbox that smells like korma sabzi, being somewhat ostracized or getting the weird looks in school in Texas, Corpus Christi, because for a lot of kids, and I have to say from my own experience, the 
the, the the reflexive reaction to that would be to want to try and fit in, would be to want to to feel bad about, you know, for me, it was like I went into an ethnic closet for most of my teens. You know, I would hope that people wouldn't know I was a Iranian. I would hear people say, oh, are you French, Gion? I kind of shrug my shoulders, hoping that that's what they would think because it was too hard. It was too hard to be different and to be from the terrorist country and all that in the aftermath of the hostage crisis and, and all of that when I was a kid. But you make this decision to embrace it. Um, can Have you explored how you had the, the uh, I mean, it's quite profound for a kid to make that decision and, and brave. Have you explored how you did that? I, I, I appreciate that, Gian. You know, I, 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 I want to say that maybe there was a stubbornness inside me as a kid feeling, I, I felt different, but I also wasn't moved to assimilate and i think assimilation for me felt somehow like death even now i speak when i think about it i i you know going to the pepper alleys go, uh, I, I don't think i ever attended a football game in my entire high school career you know and and and, and i instead i would lock myself in my room like studying and learning the red leaf without without teachers i i first began without you know, having any masters to, to support me on this path and being stubborn is not a good enough answer. I understand that. I, I feel that maybe part of it was I, I felt that I was geographically removed from where I probably should be. Hmm. I, I yeah. felt that. I felt the expat in me. I felt, and, and a part of it was, um, you know, living in South Texas, automatically you're, you're living in, in, in a borderland. You're living somewhere that's close to the Mexican border. We're only a couple hours away. I, just two days ago, I was literally in the Rio Grande, soaking in a hot spring, like in the border. And I think when you're in the border area, you're, it's the confusion even grows because you also have this population uh, that you know this place used to be Mexico. Mm -hmm. So then you have mm -hmm. you kind of you kind of feel that okay, well I I'm different. I'm not Mexican. I'm not white. I'm not. Uh, you know, I don't really identify with any anything going on around me. So I kind of just delve deeper and deeper inside my own psyche. And I always knew that uh, I'm larger than this space for myself. Did you grow up speaking Farsi in the family? I I did. I did. I I, I you know I have I have three other siblings. We're four. Uh, I do speak. Like uh, I. I I don't know if they would appreciate me saying this, but I, <laughs> I do speak better Persian than than them. Uh, at times, I even find myself correcting my own parents. You know, <laughs> it's kind of weird, <laughs> but uh, I, I just love it. You know, Xian, I also I I learned at a young age that I have a voice and I can sing. My I was like everyone was applauding that in me, and I, and maybe and the love of singing, the love of actually being able to make music at a young age and and tapping into this music, uh, it excited me. And I felt that, you know, I, I felt this responsibility that I need to learn this. And, and the older and older that I've become, you know, I've, I've, I've reached a place where I feel like this is this was my this was my karmic, uh, you know, path. I, I, I needed to acquire this wisdom so that I can actually help people just like myself, because, we're, we're, you know, we, you and I, we feel like oddballs, right, for, for these polarities. But there's so many of us. The diaspora mm -hmm. is is riddled with mm -hmm. with Persian Americans, Persian Canadians, mm -hmm. Persian Europeans, that and and all over the world. And I and, and I imagine that you know when when parents come out, you know how how do they navigate you know their kids being ostracized or, or them having to assimilate and hide in the closet of, uh, for their their culture or their identity? I, I took on a revolutionary approach. I don't know. I don't know where it bubbled up from. Maybe I'm a Sagittarius. <laughs> well, 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 actually, you took a very 21st century approach. I mean, I, I could see kids these days. I, I should hope, and I see them being socialized to to appreciate being unique, appreciate being the other. You know, it's like I'm gonna I'm gonna hold steadfast. This is who I am. This is my background. This is my. Uh, which is not to say that we're living in some post racial society or something, but but just to say that I think it is a little easier now. But you know. 20 years ago 30 years ago 40 years ago that to say i'm i'm the other that's okay i'm going to embrace it i'm going to play the setar <laughs> i'm going to sing in persian and i live in texas and i'm not going to go to the football games it, it is um that's the part that feels um profound to me right and um you know i i remember pulling out the setar back in 2003 we were at camp casey um i'm sure you remember the cindy sheehan 
movement during the the Bush administration with the with the Iraq War with the right. weapons of mass destruction. We we went out there in protest, uh, and Willie Nelson was out there, and and I never I'll never forget when he saw me pull out the Persian sitar. He goes, "That's a funny looking guitar right there," <laughs> <laughs> and that always stuck with me, just feeling like you know. I, I wonder, I, but but at times when when I start playing Masanan Mahul Daskoy Mahul, when I'm playing you know our major scale uh, mode, uh, at times it sounds very Appalachian. It sounds extremely country. And and at at a certain point, what's what I found really beautiful is like expressing the folk in our music. Mm. And folk connects with all folk uh, folk as a genre uh, throughout the world. Like when, when you listen to. Appalachian music, or if you listen to like uh, s- some some of the licks you see on banjos, it, it very much falls in line with what you hear in Africa, what you hear right, in, right, in, right, yeah, yeah, and Loristan, and and that connection right there, it it further excited me. Ob- obviously, all of the uh, my my assimilation or or my my uh, my re- reconciliation of my of my culture. I think musically, I was I was often like, well, in order to be truly authentic, I just need to tell my own story. And that's what has been the path of my music. I've just been telling the story of who I am. If I fall in love with so and so, I write a song about so and so, and and it comes out through the through the language and the means that I know. But 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 there, I mean, with microtone and my recent project, I, and actually a few years prior to that, I've uh, I felt a deeper connection with the source. I know. Let me get to that. Let me get to that. Yeah. First, <laughs> first, first when you say you that. tell the story, I mean you sing in Persian. In Radif, you actually now teach Radif. Can you explain to folks what what that actually means? Sure. So, so the Radif is the immaculate collection of of melodies and rhythms uh, based on a twelve, thirteen modal scale. Now, a mode is a scale, right? But but there is something deeper to these uh, scales because you have a, th- a thematic theme that's based in melody that has been passed down. Uh, from generation to generation to generation, and Hameinam the Surat to Sina to Sina, it's been from chest to chest. So it's been an, an you know, an auditory uh, passing down of information that you know fairly recently has been brought to notation. And there's there's recordings, obviously, from a hundred and so years ago. Uh, but the Radif uh, is a system of music that is very particular to Iran and Iranian identity. So our classical music repertoire, uh, we have a system where within each mode you have a series of gushes, and these gushes are are melodic frameworks, and, and they're rhythmic. Sometimes they're non-metric, and then learning the concept of of, uh, of improvisation within these frameworks is is quite interesting. You know what? What another interesting point is that. The radif is not even widely celebrated amongst Iranians in Iran anymore. Interesting. Can you, can yeah, you, I didn't ask yeah. you beforehand if, if this is possible, but so it's okay if you say, well, I think you can say no, but, but I prefer you say yes. Can you sing? Can you give us an example of, of the radif scale versus, um, versus a, a Western one? Right. I mean, well, I mean, I, I could say that it's the microtone. So for example, if I don't know if this, this, uh, this instrument is going to be able to be, Heard here, so we have these quarter tones. What instrument is it? What are you playing? Uh, it, it's it's a Persian sitar. Okay. Yeah. So, for example, so that right there, that note that you hear, right. that's a microtone. So that wouldn't exist in a, in a, in a non uh, Persian scale. So, for example, uh, these microtones that. You hear in, in classical Persian music. You can also hear them in Arabic Maghrib music. Um, you don't have these microtone. microtone. I just took, I, I didn't even put it together before. So it's like a microtone is smaller than a semitone. It's the note. It's the sound in between one note and the semitone above it. Right. So like in, in between uh, an A natural and an A sharp, right. for example. You right. Have, you it's have like a, a bend. A bend. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And, 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 and these notes, you know, they bring a certain flavor, they bring a certain emotional, you know, just like the blues when you tap into like a pentatonic scale, for example. But then you can add a little microtone in there. Mm. 
now it's a little bluesy and Persian. <laughs> <laughs> I, to, to, yeah, it doesn't sound that much different from each other. Uh, Farid, I, don't, I, I appreciate that, you're, that some musicians might hear the nuances. I think I heard the microtones, but it sounds like a, a, a guy who knows how to play the star really, setar really well. Uh, can you sing uh, Iradif style so we get an idea of what that means? Sure, of course I can. Uh, let me let me see if uh, um, so. For example, like we've been studying um, Bayat Tork. This has been our our most recent. Uh, so we pick a mode per season. We in the summer we did Daskoy Shur, which is one of the most important modes in classical Persian music because we have these tributary modes that are called Abad. There's five of them, and they're tributaries of Daskoy Shur. Which is one of one of the called the mother. Hey, hang on, it's getting a little inside baseball. Make sure. Imagine there's an audience that don't don't don't. don't some people don't right, are not right, musicians. Right. Yeah. yeah, I I I gotta watch that. I, I can nerd out on it all night. But <laughs> yeah. um, so so uh, we're doing a test. So we have test sneaks, which is like a ballad, and we we studied and by the Um This is a poem by Rumi. Okay. It's in in the mode of by the Torque and Gusheye Mehrabani. So it goes, for example. Ayu sofe khoshnomemo khoshmi ravi barbomemo ayi dar shekaste jomemo ayi dar davide I love it. <laughs> I love it. You know what that is? Do I know what that is? You know what that is? That's the sound of Texas. <laughs> that is the sound of Texas. <laughs> and why not? You know, I I love yeah. it. So, uh, so um, I would know that as as a sort of modal. Is modal and radif the same thing? It is the same thing, uh, except with with Radif, there is certain rules and regulations that, that exist in the music theory. So, for example, in order to modulate, to go from one musical space to another musical space, there is these sort of bridges that, sh that you learn along the way and how to, like, jump from one space to another space. But then the thing is, it a, a lot of even Persians, Iranians, they, they feel that, oh, this music is very confining. Like, I, I know one of the great uh, Persian poet Sham Lu, he, he gave a, a speech in Berkeley, I believe, uh, before he passed away many years ago. He, he, he was of the, of the idea that, oh, Persian music is very limited. It doesn't allow for creativity, it doesn't allow for change because it's, it's, a, it's a structure that you cannot really alter. You just have to play what has been passed down. But I, I don't see it that way. And, and actually, Radif isn't that way. What Radif is... It allow, it's sort of like a, a free uh, space for you to make music. You can improvise in it in ways that it, it creates sounds that you can't even imagine. So it's very improvisational in, in its core, and I, and I believe that that improvisation can really fly when you learn the repertoire, when you learn the modes, you learn the, the melodies. And, and when that seeps into your soul, then only then you can begin to improvise and to create and to reimagine because yeah. that authenticity needs to sit somewhere before yes. you start. So you have to know how to make Gorma Sabzi before you add uh, a new ingredient. Before you fuck I with the Gorma Sabzi. Yeah, absolutely. That, that, <laughs> there's no, no question about that. Uh, uh, you know, let me continue uh, uh, with your story. And you, you said a few moments ago, as a, as a kid and as a teenager, I guess, you, you, were, you had this feeling that you belonged geographically, you said, somewhere else, presumably being, that being Iran. So you moved to Iran in 2008. Um, 2006. What, sorry, 2006. Six. That's right. You stayed there until 2008. When, when you moved there in 2006, uh, when you arrive in Iran, I mean, ultimately, there's, there can be the fantasy of, oh, well, that's where I belong. But, you know, you are the kid who grew up in Texas, notwithstanding some visits to Iran. When you arrived there to live there, did it feel like the place where you belong? Um, at times, yes. And at times, that's when, that's when I realized that I'm actually uh, a Texan hanging out in Tehran. <laughs> there, 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 were, there, there were times where I was met with um, uh, cultural resistance because of the, the assumed 
um, sort of privilege of having a U.S. passport, have, being able to live in America and, and some of the scenes. But, but ultimately, uh, I found Iran to be extremely loving, extremely kind, extremely giving. Uh, I learned so much. I, I have friends there that I that I still keep in touch uh, on a daily basis, and um, but but I but it was but it was only then when I moved and I lived in Tehran studying with uh, my own studs that I, I'm not as Iranian as I thought I was, hmm. and and I, and I think I think that was a very valuable uh, lesson for me because. Uh, it was then that I, I began to, you know, reconcile with my other half, the other half that I, I sort of like took a blind eye to. And uh, so when I, when, I, when I began recording in the studio in Tehran, I, I began endorsing that part of myself. And I, and I realized that, you know, I, I'm, I'm not here to put out uh, music that's strictly classical in nature. I, I'm, I'm here to tell a story. Isn't I this think interesting? Being, you, went, you went to Iran partly to find your American side. <laughs> Exactly yeah, right, yeah. you know, and um, and it was there that I realized that oh well, I I actually this is this is my reality, this is who I am, and I and I, I began actually endorsing that part of myself, you know, I, I began realizing that no, this is an opportunity for me to you know bring the best parts of both sides and you know give it give it birth because that I mean that that is who I am. Your whole life uh, is <laughs> your whole life is existing somewhere where you're an oddball and endorsing that side of yourself. <laughs> 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 which is uh, the plight of many of us. I really appreciate that you put it into words. Um, it, it's 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 quite great. There's something about you. You had said some story about how you there was a group of people that uh, I don't know if you started this or there was a, a group of you guys that, that would get together and and were expats or people from uh, other parts of the world who had returned or who came to Iran and you would meet in Tehran. Tell me about that. Right. You, you know, at that time, it was, I believe, in the in the middle of the first term of Ahmadinejad. And, and there, there was actually a big uh, return exodus of I- Iranian kids that had either never lived in Iran. And they had just gra- I had just graduated and uh, I was 25, 26. And it was in that age range from 25 to about 35 that that a lot of these kids uh, such as myself, we we moved to Tehran looking for uh, a home, looking for uh, many of us looking for a job, you know, and 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 I think there was a um, a a sickness, uh, especially with with many liberals, uh, if I can call myself that, still um, that we we left, you know, I mean, I, I know that I did, and many Iranians that had left America for Iran for Tehran, they were they were looking for a place that uh, they can recreate or or to be a pioneer in some way I th- and I think that 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 energy did did exist inside myself and we, we created this little group called cosmopolitan Tehran and and every Monday we'd get together at some mm-hmm. coffee shop and we we discuss like what do we feel what do we see in Tehran like what are we doing sometimes we would even create these environmental projects where we would take sticks and uh, sharpen the edge and go up to Darband in the mountains and you know pick up trash you know, something that, that we, we, we were trying to implement, like, you know, how do, how do we love, how do we better our, our, our backyard here? And how do you pay it forward in Iran? Yeah, yeah. exactly. When you talk about being, um, realizing that you, how American you really are uh, when, you, when you're in Iran in that period, how, how did that play out? I mean, there's this sort of obvious stuff you go into a shop and you order some bread or something and somebody th- realizes you have an accent or but uh, I mean in terms of um, interpersonal relationships or or um, um, the, the way you interacted with people tell me tell me how you learned the differences between growing up in the West and and growing up in Iran or can you give a couple of examples right uh, you know you know I actually I, I didn't have an issue with the accent part with the in the bread shop or, or in the taxis actually people really couldn't really tell but but where where it did became quite obvious to me was I was writing uh, I was writing uh, music reviews for a online magazine called Tehran Avenue uh, and f- funny that it was called Tehran Avenue in the English language you know they, they didn't have a a Persian uh, and, right and and when when I was writing for them uh, there was a group of these uh, intellectuals a, a lot of them uh, were were extremely passionate about their ideas and their beliefs and as I was but but I think it was the willingness and it was like the 
the childlike essence of like uh, there was a happy joy in me to come and really embrace and love and and hold everyone. And I, I because I hadn't been living in the Islamic Republic for thirty years, thirty some years or so, I I wasn't anchored in the same experiences of right, right. Uh, uh, of that society. And and not not having not that I wasn't trying to understand that part. It it just wasn't in my psyche. I, I had grown up. You know, in a space where relatively, you know, you know, freedom is, is a concept that's very relative, and we can talk about that. But, but for me, I think I think the 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 willingness for me to really extend a, a hand of friendship was met with, um, especially in that in that writing scene uh, at Tehran Avenue, with uh, a little bit of resistance. Right. And that resistance was because they're like, well, you're you're a tourist, you know. Like, oh, actually, somebody had said, you're, you know, I remember one of the writers. We we were. You know, they would get together, I believe, I don't know, I forget, it was when every Wednesday or Thursday we'd get together and drink dark coffee. Everyone would be chain-smoking cigarettes, and they would be angry, yelling, giving out. It was a bunch of po- angry post-Marxists. It was really interesting. <laughs> and one of them uh, said, well, you know, because I was there at the table with a few others, such as myself, that we had come to Iran, and they assumed we're just there partying, having a good time, and then we're going to head back. So we were called tourists. And you know, I, I wrote I wrote an article, and I I have submitted it a week later. And Tehran, I said, from terrorist to tourist. Right. Wow. How <laughs> I am perceived one way in a place of my birth, and how yeah. I'm perceived as the other, where I've always identified as probably my yeah. true home. That stings. And well, it it did, but you know, it was also a, a beautiful learning experience because you know, as a 25, 26 year old. Um, what more? What more of a capacity do we do we understand, and how how we're connecting? And and now, as you know, in, in my mid thirties, I, I look back at that time, and I and I'm like, wow, if only, if only I was more present to listen before. Well, I well, well you you also idea. get it, right? I mean, you get you you hate being called the tourist, but you you understand that they're looking. You're smart enough to know they're looking at you, kind of going. Who's the new kid with all the exuberance? You know, we've been through all this shit, and he thinks that you know, <laughs> life's a party, right, or or whatever. It, exactly. Yeah. I I was there to 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 be friends with everyone to talk about, and and also like my my love for the culture. There in com, in coming down to it, you know, their their biggest gripe or the biggest uh, issue that they had was they they wanted to really embrace their Iranian side, but at the same time. Uh, they they were writing for an online magazine where everything was being translated into English, and uh, and th- there's a term they have in Persian called qarb zadegi, which means you are you are so Western struck, and 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 what I found and and I think what what really uh, became of an annoyance was like why is this kid that's born in America in Tehran writing about Radif, writing about classical Persian concerts and uh, on such a on such an you know passionate level and i think i think that passion uh you know you, i i wonder how i would feel about classical persian music if i grew up in tehran hmm. you know i i wonder if if maybe i would be a, a pink floyd affectionado i i do love pink floyd actually and uh that's but, the correct but, answer <laughs> yes oh, but so tell me why you ended up leaving farid why why not stay in iran um because iran had I felt it had provided me, you know, the, I left in uh, right at the beginning of 2008 and there, there was an energy and vibe in the city where things were becoming uh, somewhat unstable in ways. Uh, and actually a lot, all those expats that we were all hanging out there for those years, working and living and trying to understand that part of ourselves, I believe everybody returned, everybody left. Uh, it, the, the society essentially rejected all those expats, including myself in a way. And, and I think it, it just wasn't sustainable because there is a glass ceiling there that's very, very evident. You know, it's very much uh, visible. And I, I felt that there was only so much I can do uh, here before um, I, I began missing the open skies. I began missing the open roads of Texas. I began missing, you know, yeah, just getting on the. I'm I'm, I'm a road tripper, you know. At, at my core, besides my my music career, I, you'll find me in the mountains. And and I felt that you know the big city vibe. I mean, Tehran is a big city. I, I also, like th- there were so many reasons, you know. <laughs> Tell me about performing and recording the song Yare Dabistani uh, in support of the Green Movement in 2009. Well, well, in 2009, all all of those kids that we talked about, those expats that were living in Tehran, or, or 
from 2006 to 2008, um, everyone jumped on board with the green movement, as I, I feel, you know, it made sense. You know, everybody did. It was it was a time of uh, of hope. People wanted change. People wanted evolution. People didn't want revolution. Uh, we were of the belief that Iran needs to alter from an internal level, and we saw this as a way in. You know, it was it. Uh, I I sang Yara Davistani uh, at that time uh, to show my support. After living in Iran for three years, I I felt uh, responsible to to be of that voice of my friends that were still living in Iran. And you know, it was it was a chant, it was a song in every protest movement across the world, inside Iran, on the streets, and it felt right. And and even to this day, you know, I I, I don't know if I've performed that song in over ten years now, to be honest. Oh wow! Uh, why is yeah, that? why it, is that? Well, I I feel like uh, I felt I feel let down. You know, I feel like a lot of us do. I feel like. You know, you, you jump on these movements in, in, in support of something, hoping for a certain outcome, and the outcome is not what you you, you get. And um, somehow, there, I feel deceived. I feel that it was uh, deceptive to uh, see all that excitement and all that built up you know, energy and, and, and the resistance that was really real. I was in the millions and millions of people standing in the streets of Tehran, surrounding Mir Hussein Mosavi and um, the vibe. It, it was a very real moment in time. It was a good chance for things to change on a fundamental level uh, as it as it needed to, as it still needs to. Um, and, when, and when it doesn't happen, you feel what's going on who who am, who am i supporting <laughs> like what's you know you, you jump on something on it R- right now i i i feel that um it's it's going in the path as, as it as it will and and i i hope for the best and i and i know that uh right now especially in iran the people are suffering the sanctions are not helping uh, and i mean i could i could get into my political views here quite a bit but i i don't want to bore you with that <laughs> Let me play a little taste of Yarud Abistani. Uh, this is Farid Shafinuri. Take a listen. Bo manu ham rohe mani Chube alef par sare mo Boz manu khokhe mani Hak shode esme manu to Rutane in tat esio Harike ye bido dosetan مانده هنوز رو تن ما Fari, that song has obvious political weight weaved into it. Did it occur to you that recording that might hamper your chances of returning to Iran did you once you left Iran did you think that you would want to go back absolutely Iran Iran is I still consider it a home I still remember Jian every street name from uh, Vanak all the way uh, down to Boulevard de Keshavars to to Qaytariya. Uh, I I was walking all across. I was I was madly in love with, it. and it's really actually I have a, a kind of a golf ball inside my throat to be honest because um, I dream of uh, Tehran. I, I wake up sometimes like thinking that I'm in Tehran uh, and feeling that you can't return to a place. And and and, and I mean I don't I don't know you know. This song that I sang was was being sung by millions and millions. Obviously, when you sing it and you record it and you put it out and make a music video, yeah. uh, it takes on a different meaning. But um, I, I I wasn't thinking like that. I wasn't thinking, well, is this going to like prevent me from returning or not? I I did what I felt was right. I did. I followed my heart, uh, and I and I feel that I and I would hope that I could I would always be on that path, which is doing what what my heart says I should do. And may- maybe one day, you know, I'll find myself back in Tehran. Maybe with you, we'll have a cup of coffee, you know, sitting on. I would love that. Uh, that would be awesome. You mean the Cosmopolitan Club Redux? 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would be great. I, I would look forward to that day. You know, there's so many things. I know I can't keep you forever, and there's so many things I want to ask you about. One of the things is that you're, you are also very much inspired by Indian music. Uh, you've been traveling within India. You've collaborated with Indian masters. You know, as, a, as an Iranian uh, pe- person of uh, Iranian descent, um, it, it kind of bugs me that, uh, I mean, I don't know if maybe I don't get it because I didn't grow up in Iran, but there there does s- tend to be some, uh, at times, kind of, um, you know, the, I mean, clear prejudice towards uh, Indians or, or, the, or the notion that of being, you know, Mokehendini steam, you know, this, this sort of idea, <laughs> right, don't right. compare us. But can you talk about the similarities that you found between Persian Persian traditional music and Indian music? Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, actually, there's far more similarity in the way that the Radif and our modal system works with the Raga system as opposed to the Magam system that you hear in Arabic music. So, so the thing that really connects us to Arabic music is um, the quarter tones. They they share the same quarter tones. A lot of them, the right. same ones that we do, but. The, the way systematically we create music is very much in line with the way the raga works, the way that they that they flow from one idea to the next. Uh, and I, I was always drawn to classical uh, Indian music as a kid. I remember watching Bollywood. My, my mother loved Bollywood movies and uh, we would we would watch them growing up. And, I would, you know, I would imagine myself as that. Uh, that good-looking Indian guy that that gets the girl at the end and <laughs> runs away, you know, off into the distance. So there was there was a childhood romantic. I roman I romanticized the culture in a way because of my love for the for the cinema as a kid. Uh, but the music would would always move me, and I, and and I knew there was something there that 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 I need to explore. I, I, it wasn't until 2015 when I when I left Paris for uh, for Mumbai and we we performed. I was in charge of a, of a project to. Uh, bring together a, a Rajasthani ensemble with a classical Persian ensemble, and we were we were going to be performing in Pune, and then from there up to Rajasthan. It was one of the most remarkable experiences of my life. But but it was only then that I that I you know just being in India, sitting with these Kamaicha players. They have an instrument called Kamaicha, uh, which sounds like Kamanche. Yeah, yeah, and it, it and and just listening to him play, listening to to their gouches, to those melodic frameworks, it sounded like Musiri Loristan, like from the, the lower region of Iran or Bakhtiari, and and I and I began exploring even further. Uh, prior to that, I I, I worked with Indrajit Banerjee, and and you know I began realizing that aha, uh-huh, Daskaye Nava is very much like Raga Bayravi, and then how how do I meld these together? I mean, I, you know, uh, others have done this. You know, Kehan Kalhor performed with Shujaat Khan. He he brought out that beautiful album, I think, in the early two thousands called Ghazal. And there was an improvisational dialogue between the Kamanche and the, and the Indian sitar. And then I was like, well, how about bringing the Persian sitar and the sitar? Because every every American, when I tell them I play the sitar, they're like, oh, the sitar. I heard that with Ravi Shankar <laughs> back in the day. I'm like, nope, this isn't that sitar. <laughs> right, right. This is the Persian sitar. And then and then bring, and and I really felt like I had a responsibility to demarcate and show the difference between these instruments. So we brought both of them on stage and we had a dialogue and it, it, it's it's been a fun ride getting to know uh, Indian classical music. It's interesting that Ted Cruz was there. I think that when uh, you're, I think that was who you're doing the accent of there. <laughs> I wasn't sure. <laughs> yeah, thankfully, so. Uh, even though actually Ted Cruz is a Canadian, I think originally. So, um, even even more layers to that uh, weird <laughs> joke I just told. Uh, <laughs> this um, this most recent project, Microtone. Uh, it, 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 there's a lot to uh, um, excavate with it, but let me uh, ask you one, one part of it, because I know it, it pays attention to Persian poems, musical explorations, choreographed dances, and has this beautiful backdrop of Persian calligraphy, but also constellations, animation of constellations. What What is the relationship for you uh, between music and astrology? Right. So so this has been my, my, my most uh, recent... Uh, you know, fixation on where does the radif or- actually originate from. So prior to the radif, the radif actually actually is a relatively new uh, naming of of a system that was based on maqams. Now maqams was the was the idea behind the modal system before they turned into dascos, and then it became more solidified in the system, and it became like a national uh, identity. The radif became something of the courts. You know, during the Qajar period. But prior to that, going back to the 10th, 12th century, you had philosophers and you had 
thinkers that were mathematicians, they were philosophers, and they were musicians. And music and philosophy and science were intertwined in a really odd way. So, you know, the, these musicians that, that would play um, these instruments, they would identify and organize their, their system of music based on the, the orbiting planets and the way uh, things associated uh, with the constellations of the stars and especially with the planets, the, the moon and the sun and the angle in which... Uh, which is why you, uh, you know, in, in Indian classical music, they also have the idea that you should play a, a raga at a certain time of the day. So, for example, in the morning, you play uh, Kiribati, and then, like, later on, you play Bhairavi in the evening. And in Persian classical music, it was the same way. They believe that in the, in, in, in the morning, you know, you play the music that's, I, that's connected to the natural world. So it's, it's a reflection of uh, the modes, the, the, the number of microtones, the, the way that the music is expressed is actually connected to the way the moon and what position it is today. Or like, for example, Zamane uh, Gorgomish, I love that term, Gorgomish, which means twilight or the time of the wolf and the prey. Uh, so you play a certain mode at that time. And, and obviously nothing is is written in, uh, in stone. We don't actually have uh, any, any uh, documentation saying that at what time of day you play which mode. But... I took the microtone project as an as an opportunity to really relift and re uh, reignite that pagan roots behind our music and go back to a time where uh, you know that that Zoroastrian connection that we have with the land with our our mysticism you know uh, and how it how it kind of mingled with Islam and creating Sufis and I feel that our music also has this this really ancient root in the natural world. You really are. You're you're like the uh, le petit prince, you know. You're like the little prince. Like you, you're on an adventure. You're on a journey. You you want to discover, right? I, that's that's a beautiful thing to say. I I would hope that I'm always a discoverer. I would hope that the adventure never ends. And and uh, it is a, it is a total adventure. I'm I'm still excited. I'm still excited about you know the next project I'm already working on and. It's exciting, uh, though. I mean, it's like you're an explorer. You don't, you're not, I mean, you, you haven't sort of, okay, I've got my sound. Now I'm going to pump out some albums. This is who I am. It, you metamorphosize, it seems. You, 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 you embrace wanting to explore and, and find new avenues. Do you have a sense of where uh, Farid Shafi Nouri will be musically like a decade from now? Uh, I, 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 I kind of do. I don't know. I don't want to jinx it, but <laughs> I, I will say this, Gian. I am more exploratory towards my roots now than I have ever been before. Mm. It is even more paramount, even more important for me to sing this music, to create this music, to now to teach this music. I have thirty some students that I that I'm responsible for, and uh, we. I I have a I have this deep burning desire to really explore those ancient roots of classical Persian music to bring that to the forefront. It doesn't mean I won't sing in English again. It doesn't mean that I won't have my, my, my band Tyrannosaurus, you know, my indie rock band that we, we performed. Yeah. Like I, I still miss, I, I still have those identities, but, but, but I do see myself going deeper and deeper and deeper into a space of, uh, of silence. And through by silence, I mean that every note counts, every note hmm. matters. So sometimes um, I, I find that I, my sitar uh, is, is a galaxy of exploration. I can, I can sit there with my instrument for eight hours a day, and I still am thirsty for more. Wow. That sounds meditative. Yeah, I, I, I would, that's why we call it Ready for Treat, because I, I feel that there is an inherent meditation to this music. It's an inherent uh, way to connect to the now, to you know, connect to our breath and and that and that and that's what these classes are taking on a form of their own. They're they're really connecting people not just to their roots, but to to being calmer and to being more in tune with who they really are. And to hear everyone's got a voice, everyone's got an ability to express themselves, and and to really help people cultivate that. Uh, you know, during COVID, uh, it's been such an honor, Gian, be helping uh, people see that part of themselves and to see them get excited to express. So, so 10 years from now, I, I, I would imagine that the, the Institute keeps on growing and, and, and bringing in uh, more wealth for, for the diaspora. 
and and we we actually have non-iranians that are learning this music right now we I have we have so, a gentleman yeah. that lives in your neck of the woods his name is tommy charles completely canadian lives in montreal you have to hear this kid sing <laughs> classical Persian music it'll just knock your I socks off it. it's ridiculous how good it is i it is such a it really is a, um, a, a real pl- I suspected it would be, but it's a real pleasure getting to talk to you. Let me, let me ask you about two final things before I let you go. And, and um, I want to go out on a, on a brand new song of yours, something called Become the Mountain. What can you tell us about this piece? Become the Mountain was a off-the-cuff improvisation in the mode of Baita Tork. Uh, it's a non-metric piece. It's an all vaz. It's based on the poetry of Hamida Musaddeq, and the poem really lends itself actually to this message, which which essentially says, uh, become the mountain and stay, become the vast fields and sing, and become the river and flow, and be true to the state in which you are in. So if you're feeling down, embrace it, don't fight it. Let it flow, let it stay. And, and the, the song, I, I think, uh, the, the improvisation, it, it was, people were like, you need to release this. And I, ha- I hadn't released a single in, in, so, in, in a little while. So it, it, uh, it took me by surprise and we put it out. It's on Spotify and um, right, that's the story. I'm going to play it right now. Farid, I, I really appreciate this. I appreciate you, the work you do, um, the education you've given us and that you uh, bring us through your music. And I, I look so forward to getting to see uh, your, your tour when it resumes and see you in person. And I thank you again for the time today. Thank you so much, Jonah. It's been a joy. Thank you very much. Khodafis. Khodafis. That's Fadi Chafinuri, a widely celebrated and acclaimed singer, songwriter, composer, multi instrumentalist, Persian setar virtuoso. Fadi joined us from Austin, Texas today. little taste of Fadi Chafinuri. We're going to play an entire piece by him at the end of this program, so stick around for that. The Rook team is reassembling, has reassembled. Captain Reza, Groovy Shaya, Kion Ducht, the fabulous Kion is on the line. Uh, Fadi Chafinuri, I love this guy. I really enjoyed doing yeah. that. I enjoyed everything he had to say. I was fascinated. I, I, I was riveted by, uh, what did he say? The... Uh, from from terrorist to tourist, <laughs> yeah, wherever he great. goes, he's an outsider. Yeah. I so loved that, and I so related to it, and I so thought he was very eloquent in the way he delivered very. all that. I, I I thought that was fabulous, Keon. The it fabulous. Was. I Keon. mean, I'm more so fixated on the fact that he's from. He's a kid that grew up in Texas. That's obsessed that's right. with traditional Persian music. That's that's interesting. The sound of Texas. That setar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, Shia, I know you're already a fan of his. You're yes, uh, I am a fan of. Uh, Far- I am a friend, mostly. Of, uh, we are friends for a long time, and um, but actually, recently we we've had a chat, and probably we we are going to collaborate on a song that oh. I composed, and he's going to sing, and uh, I like his voice. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is the song "This Too Shall Pass"? <laughs> You're just gonna keep doing that one with different people. <laughs> exactly. No, but it's related to that concept. <laughs> of, 
Uh, well, that's great. I look forward to hearing you guys together. And Captain Reza, would you like to say anything about Farid Shafi Nouri? You know what? He's, uh, by t- listening to the interview, he sounds like an eloquent, articulate, well-educated fellow. When you look at his Instagram, or for people who don't know him, <laughs> go check out his Instagram. He's such a quirky, cool, and uh, totally, totally my kind of crazy guy. Again, like you know, most of our audience is on Spotify and SoundCloud, yeah. and I, I guess also Instagram. If you go to our YouTube, uh, and if you're watching, the show on YouTube and and you'll see in the introduction we put up a bunch of different graphics you can see the different looks of Farid yeah. Shafi Nouri you're absolutely right he's a very interesting looking guy very. doesn't look like your average no. Texan no. <laughs> um, and uh, in, in his case that's a fabulous thing all right you know each week she enriches our lives by teaching us on Mondays language that we did not know, at least some of us. And she completes us in our mission to be perfect English and Persian blended specimens. She is the person behind the popular Inglisi Farsi Instagram page. But as importantly, she's the Persian priestess of Proverbs, the Australian sage of sayings, the wondrous woman of words, and our resident Rook Wordsmith. She joins us from Australia. She is Mona from Melbourne. <laughs> Yeah. Hello, Mona. <laughs> Hello. The music is so zazzy. I love That's it. That's right. That's Mona <laughs> playing know. all of those instruments uh, <laughs> live from Australia. How are you Hello. down under and what are you bestowing upon our imaginations today? Oh, we're fabulous down under, and um, today we're going to be talking about um, a tough nut to crack. A tough? 2021. Oh, okay. <laughs> the year? A we're talking nut. about the year? Yeah, well, we thought 2020 was going to be the year that was going to be challenging, but it seems that this year has a bit of a curveball as well. So, um, the English equivalent is that he's a tough nut to crack. Uh, but the Persian equivalent is Kare Hazrate File. Ah. Hmm. Have you all heard this one before? I know that one I, well. I have never heard this oh, one. Oh, Kare Hazrate File. Oh, cute. Yeah, no. My dad used to say that all the time. It's about, it's no, like, a, it's the work of an elephant, right? Or yes. something like that. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the, you'd think that because of an elephant, they're so, you know, elegant and graceful and they're like very majestic. You know, that's probably the link into why we use the the fill as a as the analogy um do you have any understanding of why they they say kara hazrat a file as opposed to any other animal i'm stuck on the word hazrat what does that hazrat mean is hazrat, like hazrat. Is, is, is his majesty is the great, the ma- oh. yeah. his excellency yeah, the excellency yeah. the, the elephant hmm. it's like i call uh, yeah. i call uh, my dog hazrat ugi you know it's the <laughs> master ugi uh well uh oh, why nice. why the elephant uh, maybe uh, captain reza or shaya might know i have no idea mm. i mean i don't think there were elephants in persia but Back in the day, were there? Does um, Shia sure do uh, <laughs> Actually, we had the best elephants. What do you mean? We invented elephants. This I can say is not all Persian. We all invented elephants. <laughs> we discovered elephants, Baba. Uh, do we have elephants, Shia? You were back. You were alive back then. Uh, um, no. <laughs> back then. I think okay. I don't remember. We can't, uh, Mona. No one <laughs> seems to have the energy to <laughs> no answer names. your, no, your but, call. But but uh-huh. I know that uh, we uh, we have a prophet called Phil. Oh, for oh. real? Is that right? Do we? Yes. A prophet yes. called like his name was Phil, or yes. is, is 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 no, elephant well, called? No, 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 Phil. Phil. <laughs> that's oh, that's interesting <laughs> because I remember my sister used to have a partner named Phil, Phil. like a British guy. <laughs> And we would say Kara has to feel, you know, like oh, it yeah. Phil's, uh, it's oh, Phil's work. Family yeah. joke. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm really curious to see what Mona wa- wants to say about Kara has to feel. Yeah. Okay, well, go yes. tell us more why, but where the saying came from. Yeah, so originally I thought it was because elephants are majestic and, you know, it's, it's a hard uh, obstacle to overcome. But it turns out it's linked in with um, Indian mythology. So the plot thickens. So the reason it's related to the elephant is actually, um, I don't know if you if you know much about Indian mythology, but um, Ganesh is actually the elephant-headed Hindu god of beginnings. Sure. Um, who was 
traditionally worshipped before any major enterprise. Um, and he is actually the reason why we've linked into Hazrat Afil. So he um, was actually born, um, well, he, I'll go back. We to discovered you. Ganesh. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's all fun. now. Religion. Now Indian prophets are discovered by Persians. You're taking my segment, Mona. <laughs> That's right. Is yeah, this? It's, it's all Persian to us. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> no, sorry. Next go ahead, Mona. <laughs> um, so his name means Lord of the People, um, and Ganesha is actually a pot-bellied, elephant-headed god who um, normally has sweets in his hand. Um, which he is very fond of. So he's got this little pot belly as well, which um, is related to his love of food. But his vehicle is actually a large Indian bandicoot, um, which symbolizes his ability to overcome anything he wants because his birth origin was actually um, quite an interesting one. His mom, which is Parvati, makes him out of a piece of cloth and asks her husband Shiva to bring him to life. Um, but once Shiva sees this handsome young boy, he becomes quite jealous and cuts his head off. <laughs> it's a bit savage um, and replaces it with, with this elephant. So this god is actually developed with the head of an elephant and the body of a man. And his ability to overcome and obstacles is related to this elephant link, which then links into Kara Hazrat Afil, which is is it's such an interesting turn of events where we link in this mythology with a Persian saying saying that he's a tough nut to crack. So if we want to overcome anything, we actually link it in with this with this elephant god from wow. Indian myth mythology. So the so our Persian saying Kara has a feel it's the work of an elephant. It's it's like that that is a big onus coming up. That is linked to an Indian god. I was so going to say, because the word Hazrat, we normally only use that to refer to a sacred or a holy right. person, uh, a prophet, yeah. an imam, or uh, of some sort. So Hazrat Efeel, I, I was always wondering where that comes from. But if, mm. when you talk about Ganesh, that's, that connects the dots quite nicely for me. You know, so um, yeah. now, uh, just to, to put a fine point on it, for the non-Iranians who if they're still with us in this segment, uh, <laughs> as they should be, because we're trying to explain this. But but um, how would we use Kata Hazrat? I mean, I think I know because of my dad, but Keon, why don't you try using it? it to, what would you do, use it to describe? So I don't know if I'm feeling lazy and a family member is like, Kata Hazrat, like telling you to work harder? Is that no, right? No, no. You would say, for example, um, fixing the global pandemic mm -hmm. is Kata Hazrat feel. So right, what, yeah, Mona? Would that work? Yes. So what's That's the English yeah. The English equivalent was what? What was it? He's a tough nut to crack. So if a situation is really challenging, um, then it's a, it's a very difficult to overcome. Then it's kara hazrat afile, or it's a tough nut to overcome. It's a very difficult situation to overcome. Ah, so it's saying stick in there and you'll get there, little buddy. Is that uh, what it is? <laughs> I don't think there's anything inspirational about it. I think it's just, <laughs> it's literally, this is a shitload of work to do. It's like uh, kara right? hazrat afile, to get Keon to sit still and not move and not smack I on the table. I cannot. So, Kara has <laughs> rather feel <laughs> nemisha in this uh, situation. Yes. Mona, there is another proverb related to feel and a hard uh, work to do. Do you know about that? A hard work to do. I mean, uh, if you give me a clue. I mean, <laughs> uh, it's the same as the Kara has rather feel and also it has feel in it. Um, no, please enlighten no. me. I'd love to learn. It, it's like, for example, when you want to do something and it's very hard to do, you would say, Ah, <laughs> oh. uh, yes. Actually, my parents have said that before to yeah. me. You wanna, yes. It's like you want to uh, send an elephant into the sky. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. In the air. Yes. Interesting. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kara Hazrat Afil is the I'm gone. That's a that's an idiom, I guess, right? That's a saying. Yes, it's yeah. an idiom this time. Yes. Uh, the, are we ever going to have a proverb? You are the Persian <laughs> priestess of proverbs. Each week you come We're up with a new there. reason to not give us a proverb. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Mona. Be safe down under. Enjoy your summer in Australia, and we'll we'll talk to you next week. Thank you, guys. Take care. Bye. Bye. That is Mona Kiani, Mona from Melbourne. Find her page at Inglisi Farsi on Instagram. It's time for Letters of the Week. The 
fabulous Keon. Yes, she Dip has. into that letters let bag. Me, what do you got for us? Well, let me start off by uh, apologizing. A few weeks back, I made a little mistake. Oh. I, uh, I gave the letter of the week to a username by the name of Grammy on YouTube, which I had mistaken the identity with another rogue listener <laughs> <laughs> by the name of Gash Hosnodon. Now, to my defense, both of them had those generic uh, YouTube uh, you know, images for their names. And so the other guy, Gash Hosp, was the guy who writes a lot. We talked about yes. him. This yes. is the one that yeah. uh, Shia said... Because the writer said, I'm a boomer. And yes. I said, I didn't know yeah. that Gashos was a boomer, right? So, so he actually, Gash, Gashos wrote in to us saying, lol, I got the letter of the week last week unrightfully. I didn't write that comment. I'm not a Pink Floyd fan, and Shia is right. I'm his age and not a boomer. <laughs> uh, How did you know that, Shia? That's interesting. Yeah, that is weird. I love that this guy, Shia, we know like he's very opinionated. He has to like say, I'm not a Pink Floyd fan. <laughs> Can't just write and say, that wasn't me. I'm not, you know, I'm not a Pink Floyd uh, fan. That's great. All right. Well, sorry. Uh, Club, yeah. So wh- who's the original? Who's Grammy? So gra- I don't know. It's just username Grammy. Well, we should apologize to Grammy. I, I apologize. That's what I... Was I, I was apologizing to both okay. Gash Usp and Grammy. So moving on. But is Grammy's name Gash Usp as well? No. Oh. It's just <laughs> so you took somebody who has a completely different name and you thought it was Gash Usp. Assumed. I, I assumed mistakenly that uh, he had updated his username to okay. Grammy. You know, they both start with a G. They both, both had that same image of no the problem. G. Of... No problem, Katie. <sighs> All right. <laughs> moving on. Good so, one. so two weeks ago on uh, episode 73, I did not make mistakes uh, we had an interview with Faradad Farahzad he's the popular Iranian British TV presenter and journalist so a lot of people wrote into that episode he has a lot of fans as I can imagine we have Shaheen Bahrai wrote this one was one of your greatest interviews with someone who can be an inspiring person for your audiences good job guys mm, thank you Shaheen and then we have Mahtab, last name listed as RT, wrote, Fardad Farahzad is one of the best Iranian journalists. I wish he stayed on BBC Persia. Lots of great guys left the channel and joined Iran International. In my opinion, both BBC and Iran International aren't that great anymore. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. Who was that? This was Mahtab. Mahtab. Do you think Mahtab might have been the Gashosp, actually? <laughs> the same person we know as Gashosp? Listen, Gian, <laughs> you better keep it down over there. Yeah, don't poke the bear. Gashosp might write to us again. Uh, I am right. not a Faradot <laughs> fan. That's right, yeah. <laughs> and I am a millennial. Yeah. Uh, cool. Then we have Gila Ibrahimi wrote, Hello, Brook team. Thank you for the interview. I followed Fardad Farahzad as a media character for a while, but had no idea he was such a deep and lovely personality. Also about Shaya's reference to Farahzad in Tehran, and this this goes back to Shaya explaining what yes. Farahzad means. Which was what? Uh, when you say fail, I'm so smart that I'm going to Farahzad, uh-huh. drink tea and come back. Uh-huh. Yeah. Khub, she talks about that, she goes on saying, I should say that there is a sad side to the story. Farahzad was once popular for its tutistans, which means white mulberry trees. And at specific times of the year, those private gardens opened its doors to the public to picnic and have tea with mulberries. Little by little, some s- smart business people offered good money to buy those tutistans and turned them to cafes and restaurants for people to have their tea and hookah there. Very soon, there was no tutistans left there and instead many ugly restaurants and cafes. So the tradition of drinking tea in Farahzad has stayed with people, but no Tutistans have been left. Mm. That's sad. They've all been wiped out. They took away the Tutistans. Yeah. Yeah. So they cut down all those trees, I would imagine? I didn't know that. That's heartbreaking. So so as well, on that episode, uh, Farahzad mentioned how he wants to end up in... Farahzad. Farahzad. Well, his last name is (laughs) Farahzad. (laughs) <laughs> All this but I've got mentioned. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to go get what another coffee. What is his coffee. name? <laughs> the famous Iranian <laughs> broadcaster that we talk. spent two hours with on the show. It's Fardad, I believe. Oh, yes. As is that. Yes, thank you. Fardad mentioned how he wants to end up in the U.S. because he thinks, um, you know, p- uh, people have more equal rights. Yeah, he's really into the U.S. He, and then he said something like, where it's totally equal. It's the most equal. Like, mm-hmm. And I was like, what about Canada? I mean, we're pretty equal right, here. Right. <laughs> cool. And then we have uh, Matty Bish wrote about that. He said, I am curious why he is seeing the U.S. as a beacon of hope. He said the U.S. is the only place that you can be black or white and be American. 
After seeing all the Black Lives Matter protests, I don't think that's true. I believe places like Canada are doing a much better job in that area. Mm. I think I agree with that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Also, who will speak for New Zealand? Little New Zealand. That's right. right. Well, are there Persians there? There must be a sure. little, little group of Persians them there. Persians are everywhere. <laughs> uh, Tina Parsa. Oh, you're right. Remember Tina Parsa yes. was uh, living she in used to New live Zealand there. for yeah, a while. Yeah, that's interesting. Huh? New Zealand. Uh, as well, last week on episode 75, we had an interview with Iranian motorbiking world record holder, as well as fashion designer and motivational speaker, mm. as, as if that wasn't enough. She's also a doctor, Dr. Moral Yazarlu Patrick. Uh, on that episode, we have a few people write in. We have a Shahla Taher wrote, I enjoyed this episode a lot. It was as if I got strength from her by listening to her. Yeah, and if you guys haven't heard this episode, I invite you to tune in. Um, This is a woman who holds the world record Mm -hmm. for motorbiking uh, over 250,000 kilometers on all seven continents, uh, most of the time alone. And pregnant Uh, at one point. And at one point for six months pregnant and still uh, on her journey. Yeah, amazing. That woman power, man. Oh, uh, and then we have as well Nazila Rafizadeh wrote, Wow, she's an amazing superwoman full of inspiration and energy. This interview was amazing. I really didn't want it to end. Knock on wood and burn Isfan for yourselves. Thanks, Gian, and all the Rook team. Because we talked about Espan yes, on that did. episode. Yeah. yeah, I forgot how that came up. Oh, yes, Mona from Melbourne was talking about uh, yes. Chesh Yeah. Uh, so last week on uh, on uh, yes that same episode uh, we had a segment of it's all Persian to us. It's all Persian to us with Kian not in me. Yes, indeed. Mm-hmm. I brought up the fact that Wonder Woman and the Amazons have Persian roots. Yes. Yeah, I know. Shocking, isn't it? So we have a Sarah Swanson wrote, "Hi Kian, I love your segment. What sources do you consult for your research? Everything has been interesting. I'm wondering if there are any books or sites you'd recommend to learn more about Persian origins." Thanks. And uh, I mean, I like the best book that I can recommend from my perspective was uh, The Persians by Homo Katuzion. I found that to be a very comprehensive view on Persian history from ancient times to present day. Um, besides that, I mean, for example, last week, someone had sent me an article that uh, one Roman had Persian origins. And I mean, I always take everything with a grain of salt. I was like, okay, let me look into this. So I just went on this uh, research journey throughout um, kind of trying to actually factualize this because I mean a lot of Persians say oh yes it, it's all right, Persian right. so uh, I, I, I mean I can link it in to uh, I'll get somebody I, be, I believe them. we discovered Ganesh the Indian god <laughs> yeah. so yeah that's right yeah but uh, yes so, so the, the actual article was from BBC uh, the BBC culture section so I can uh, link that in as well as write uh, the book that I recommend I don't know Gian do you, do you recommend any uh, Persian history books did you books? say you, that you're going to write the book no I, I did I, I no, I'm going to respond to her comment. Uh-huh. That's what I meant to say. I, I was going to say the great source will be the book you've written. About, uh, <laughs> I Persian wish I wrote a book. <laughs> uh, no, the greatest source is Rook. You uh, tune That's into right. Rook and you'll find out each week what's all Persian to us. Yes. On that note, it's time for the letter of the week. Oh. Ooh, that was the saddest clap I've yeah, ever Well, it was the lead-in was like, in that yeah. time we have the letter of the week. I was Very hoping quick. you guys. All right, letter of the week. Whoa. Oh, this was for episode 76. Last week we had an interview with hip hop artist After Hill. We have a username on Facebook uh, named Bidar Show, which literally means wake up. <laughs> uh, he or she wrote, absolutely enjoyed listening to After Hill. Never came across a 23 year old Iranian this real. He was honest, talented, truthful, and not an attention seeker. Moreover, he's only 23. I praise his hardworking parents, too, who showed him how not to melt in the pockets of today's Iranian Canadians with dirty money. Mm. So he shines out. Good point. And he says, also, enjoying Kian's It's All Persian to Us segment. She presents it well, despite disliking her expired political views and stands on life. Yes. <laughs> That's you know what? That's okay. That's, uh, okay. that's okay. That's an excellent <laughs> letter. <laughs> Why do you think I picked it? <laughs> Bidar Show will probably be getting a vaccine. Yes, Bidar Misham. Unlike some of the other Natas people. Natas Bidar Show, Bidar Shodam. 
<laughs> thank you very much, Bidar Show. Uh, thank you very much, the fabulous Keon, Captain Reza, Groovy Shia. Now, Sh- uh, Groovy Shia, we're going to go out on some music yes. by the fabulous Farid Shafi Nouri, right? Yes, yes, yes. Do you have a song lined up? Yes. All right. What, what is it? Ah. Let me just say that this is full time for Rook for today. Our website, rookmedia.com, is where you can read the latest Rook read from Thoughtful Nagin on whether Iranian artists should feel the need to be political. It's an interesting read. Go to rookmedia.com. You can also support us there by subscribing or actually support us on our patrons page. Thanks to the amazing show who put this, uh, thanks to the amazing people who put this show together, and also the amazing show that put the people together. Producer Susan, Ponza the Artist, Thoughtful Nagi, and the fabulous Keon, Savvy Roham, Aghai Mehrdad, Master Muhammad, Captain Reza, and Groovy Shaya. Thank you to all of you out there for supporting and sharing our content. And find me on Instagram at Gian Gomeshi. This is Fadid Shafinuri and a piece called Become the Mountain. Mizun Bashi.
سخن از متلاشی شدن دوستی است و عبس بودن پندار سرور آور مه